Welcome back on the AM show. We kickstart the big stories from uh, the, the end of Parliament and quite some action last week, especially Thursday leading into Friday and Friday itself. So those two Supreme Court nominees are getting through, those six appointees of the executive, I'm talking about the ministers and deputy ministers, also scaling past that hurdle. But how exactly did things pan out for the minority, which had been ferocious in terms of saying they were not going to support uh, some of these nominees. Well, it didn't turn out that way on voting day, and some uh, of the industry watchers, some of those in the political space, have accused the minority of being wishy-washy and not sticking to principle. In fact, some have gone as far as saying that this minority is the worst in the Fourth Republic, that is, of this Eighth Parliament. Well, we get into uh, those all-important issues uh, this morning as we host our uh, guests are joining us for the conversation. We do have joining us, we have Dr. Kwame Asasanti. He's a lecturer at uh, the University of Ghana Political Science, also head of the Center for European Studies. Professor Kwabena Safakantanka is uh, a lecturer at the University of Cape Coast. He is also a parliamentary affairs analyst. And we're joined by the member of parliament for Tamale Central, Murtala Mohammed. Gentlemen, a very good morning to you. Good morning, Ben. All right, How so we you? have. I like your smoke. Thank you, thank you. I was saying, boso, like like you would yes. usually do. <laughs> uh, so thank you, Doc, for joining the conversation. I'll start with what you make of the happenings in Parliament last week. On the back of what we've not got uh, out of the way yet uh, has to do with those three bills. Uh, the levies or taxes, so to speak, but the Supreme Court nominees out of the way. But focal point, the nominees of His Excellency Nanado Danko Kufuado have passed. They have gone through. There was talk that the likes of Katie Hammond were a bit um, anxious uh, about how things would go, but things went their way by and large. What do you make of that entire process? Before we get into the minority, and uh, ju let's just look at the process, everything that happened. What do you make of it? Um, it was a good one, but uh, before I, uh, I start, let me say hello to uh, my friends on Zoom and then uh, those uh, who are also watching us. Um, it went well at the beginning. We saw the NDC, which has said time and again that they were not going to allow uh, the president to add any number to the existing, uh, you know, ministerial uh, numbers. So we were all hopeful that uh, they would be able to do the needful. But the story is there, the verdict is out there for us to see. Uh, the process went well. It was uh, peaceful in terms of the voting. We saw peaceful voting, peaceful counting of ballots, and then declaration of results uh, and all. I think uh, for the, the pre-election phase, everything went well. Uh, the advocacy was there. Uh, we saw the three-line whip issued by a minority uh, to its uh, caucus members that they should... Uh, be able to defend the interests of most Canadians uh, relative to the issue we are looking at. So uh, we were hopeful. We were only uh, to see a turn off, a turn around <clears throat> uh, relative to the issue. Uh, this is where uh, some of us have problems. But uh, this is my uh, intro uh, for the discussion. But if you permit me to go into details, why not? Please, please go ahead. You say, uh, to your disappointment, what exactly disappointed you about the process? One, um, if you look at the promises the NDC gave us, that they were going to make sure that not even one person will be added onto the existing list of, I think, 83 or 82 uh, ministers of state. So we're very, very hopeful that, yes, We'll get that because if you look at our economic situation, are you, are you referring to the 86 that we already have? Yes, the 86 we already have. Right. Uh, so we were very hopeful that, yes, we are going to get that because at this point in time, all that we need to do to ensure value for money and that we cut waste. We don't need anybody to tell us. We ourselves should do self-introspection and then go on that tangent. That's it. 
So, um, only to uh, hear them, uh, to say that, yes, we're not going to allow that. And then in no time, when uh, the, the, at the 11th hour, uh, this is what Ghanaians got from them. That's unfortunate. For me, um, as a student of politics, it brings a lot of things to the fore. One, that uh, we cannot trust them. I, for one, I believe that um, anytime they uh, say something, I will take it with a pinch of salt. And I'm saying that because of what uh, I have noticed uh, for a while now. Let me give you an example. Uh, we, we heard from NDC, Minority in Parliament, before the approval of the VAT, that they were not going to allow that. And that they would resist that, they would throw it away. We all saw the result. At the end of the day, uh, when they were voting, somebody was missing. And we know the story too well for me to recount it here. That was very unfair to us. My uh, beef with them is that, look, uh, you can decide not to tell us anything. Don't, don't quip, you know, uh, don't, don't whet our appetite if you like. Don't do that. Don't tell us something to expect, only to turn around at the 11th hour and give us something different. No. That one, once you do that, the effect is that you create credibility crisis in your own camp. That nobody is going to take your word for it because anytime you say something at the last minute, you can chicken out. And that is something that is going to affect them big time. Because if you all look what you have done, we have taken political notice of it, which of course we have taken. And when we are voting, we can show you the door. All right. Uh, our power lies in the fact that we will vote when the time comes for us to renew their mandate. So that is one thing they should not take us for granted with. The second issue is that uh, you realize that they were not interested in the national issue, but they are parochial, uh, you know, individual in interest. Why am I saying that? This is the, the cry of a lot of Ghanaians. For Christ's sake, we'd have loved them to what? You know, defended the people of this country by voting against uh, the nominees. What did they do? So. Here you are. They give massive votes. If you look at the, the, the statistics, all right, um, they, they, they voted. People have argued that how do you even disaggregate uh, who voted for who and all that. The question is that if you have allowed, if they have voted that 136 massively, you realize that it would have exposed those in the majority if all of them even voted uh, for the candidate. Because you and I know that not all of them were present. At least three were out. Out of the 138, three, it becomes 135. And if you voted 136, we would have seen the difference. So they have no case. It was deliberate. They were not interested in the interest of Ghanaians. Uh, they were doing their individual bidding mm -hmm. and the rest of it. That's unfortunate. But I also, as a, a student in this area, I understand uh, from the perspective of the system of government that we have in place. This system of government is a hybrid. So it has both presidential and parliamentary features. Right. And one of the features of the presidential system is the weak party discipline, which is associated with the system, that you can whip members to line. Uh, that is, the party cannot whip eight members in parliament to line to vote in a certain direction because there is a fixed tenure for the president and for the government. All right, provided the president is not impeached, he will run his uh, term, uh, full term, without any problem. But if you are operating, operating a parliamentary system of government where there is what? A vote of no confidence that any major policy that is defeated on the floor of the House right. can see the exit of the government. Right. Then the story would have been different. You will see that people would toe the line of the political party and do the bidding of the party. Uh, so on this call, you realize that we are seeing in our system more of a parliamentary, sorry, a presidential system, you know, manifesting itself with what? A weak party discipline that you cannot whip any party member to lie. So uh, I'm sure going forward, they will learn this and then take proper note of that, that they, especially the leaders in parliament, that at a point in time, if you want to what? Uh, whip them to line and you, you can do that behind the scenes. But if you come out, and then they go against your word, then what happens? It means that you are not in control. But I will say that, yes, the party is in control. Right. Except that 
for a system like that, you need to manage your expectations very well so that you don't get shocked. Because mm. uh, the system can, you know, given the nature of the system, anything can happen. These are my few remarks. Anything can happen. Hold for me, Doc. Let me bring in the member of parliament for Tamale Central, who also, uh, who also is a member of the minority caucus in parliament. Uh, Mutale, a very good morning to you, sir. Good morning and good morning to your cherished listeners and viewers. I don't know... Uh, just, just hold for me. Don't, don't, don't go into it yet. I was just welcoming you. I'll, I'll pose the question and then uh, you, you give no, your I answers. Just, I just want to know the one I had. Is it my lecturer, Dr. Dr. Kwame Asante. He is oh, the one on the other line. That's what I just want to know, yeah. All right. So Dr. Asante says uh, the, your side in Parliament was not interested in the national interest, but parochial interest. And when you do the disaggregation, I mean, you've seen your own party secretary, uh, Fifi Kwete, on, on social media, giving approvals here and there. Oh, thank you for sticking to the cause and all of that. Uh, we didn't see some names pop up. Then we see the likes of Franklin Kujo on Twitter. He says, and I want you to respond to this, the NDC party in leadership in parliament or the NDC party leadership in parliament and out of parliament lost the vote. Will they ever be united and deliver on the many vexed issues Ghanaians want or the MPP just outsmarted them again? 2024 is slipping away. What would be your assessment of what happened Thursday, Friday, and these some of these assertions that are made from Dr. Asante and the likes of Franklin Kujo. Well, first and foremost, unfortunately, I have to disagree with my lecturer in some of the issues he raised. Uh, but don't get me wrong, Dr. Asante is one of the outstanding lecturers I have had, but I would have to disagree with him. And I guess he won't be worried because he taught us to express our opinion and convictions and issues, even if it means disagreeing with them. And I just have to disagree with him. In the first place, not three members of the MPP were absent. That is not an accurate information. As a matter of fact, only a Zafo was absent. It was that morning we got information that one of our colleagues had collapsed and he was taken out. So it won't say two members were absent. But that, that is not to justify the despicable actions taken by some members of our time. Two, to say that the NDC disappointed and that they we would have to be shown the exit. And repeatedly, his, his statement is generalizing. And when you generalize that way, the impression anybody gets is as if the entire caucus of the NDC disappointed. It, it, it reflects on your entire caucus. It doesn't matter yes, whether I'm not, saying, please, obviously no, some of you did no, not vote for it. No, no, no. I'm saying that it is not accurate. When you make that statement, the impression anybody gets is that the entire caucus, because when you say that you show the NBC and exit, the NBC is disappointing. I think that is not fair because it is not everybody who did so. And mind you, when he also said that he is making the conclusions he made, based on the fact that we disappointed the people of this country, not only in this, also in the matter of the fact. I think that that would be unfair because if you look at where the NDC as a caucus point, that they were going to do certain things and did them, there are more than the things they disappointed. One, the elections of the speaker, the NDC promised that they were not going to agree. And indeed, at the time when we made that promise, we knew we didn't have the number. We voted and then the speaker that we wanted, and I believe that the likes of Anza Santi wanted to go for the strength of our democracy, a speaker from the, an opposition party, we delivered two. On the matter of the budget, it is very clear that we said we were against the budget. People like Anza Santi said the budget was not supposed to be, to be accepted because of some of the things in it. We voted and rejected the budget, and we all saw what happened, that the NDP, the convention, that invented the constitutional provisions and the standard order to have the budget passed. On the matter of the e-levy, again, we promised that we were not going to accept the e-levy. We voted and rejected the e-levy, even though we didn't have the numbers as compared to the NDC. So it is not, it is not fair if you conclude that the NDC is appointed because of ABC. Where we promised, we delivered more than where, unfortunately, we disappointed the people of the country. And two, I think that we need to look at something very clear. In this fourth republic, 
there has never been a minister in this state. Let's get this very clear. And I'll give you an Sorry, example. What did you just say? I missed that. You say in this I fourth republic. In this fourth republic, I'm not aware of where a minister has ever been rejected, regardless the number of seats that party has. That is not to justify the shameful act. Uh, part of, part of my interjection, but in this fourth republic, we've never had these numbers. In this eighth no, parliament, no, we've had no, a very no, close no, shave. I in this fourth republic, this is the first time we're having this, which is why more people expect more if, of the minority. If, no, Ivan, if you are doing an This is Benjamin, please, not Evans. If, so, Benjamin, if you are doing an intellectual analysis, mm. you need to look at sentences. And if you permit me, let me just conclude. Right. In the, in this, in this eighth parliament, the NDC had about 113 seats. Mm. The NPP had about 106. So the difference of just five seats. Okay? It was a difference of, no, the seventh, the, that's the fifth parliament. It was a difference of five, five seats. That's the problem, President Mohammed. On the matter of our general secretary when he was appointed, the NPP said they were against his appointment. Right? Hello? I'm listening to you, sir. Go ahead. He said they were against his appointment. In fact, in that parliament, the NPP had 113, and the NPP had 108. That is the big part. Now, when Honorable CP issue came up, and the NPP gave a straight line good decision that we are going to reject Honorable CP's appointment. The issue statement, their party leadership spoke, their parliamentary caucus spoke to that, and to granted interviews and said that they were not going to approve Honorable CP. At the end of the vote, Honorable Fisu got 117 votes. Because NDC had 113. So it means that, and, and, and those, that is, those who voted for him were 117, and those against 107. So it means that four members of the NDC disregarded the line. So it is not just about this parliament. Now, if you want to go by the logic, because the NDC had the majority, then one would expect that Honorable Fisu was going to get what? The 113. He got more votes, more than the number of MPs that he in the in Parliament, and got four members from the MPs who voted for it. But that is what I'll just leave there. What happened on that day was the disappointment, not just to other people, a disappointment to everybody, but to also conclude that because of what happened, the MPs are so disunited, and that they don't think that they can get to this in four. I think that that was part. All right. This is just a split. And that is why I have given you examples where the NDC promised and delivered. They are more than unfortunately where we promised and couldn't deliver. And in any case, don't put this in I, I have to bring in my other guest, Murtala, so but please I'm please wrap on that point. Let me just conclude on one thought. Don't would agree with me that the position of political science is that, look, the fifth system is something that doesn't other well for democratic growth and development. Because don't would agree that in certain instances, as a democratic part a, a, a country, where you have a hybrid system, we have all been arguing that with the hybrid mixture of our policies, we should insulate the executive arm from, from the legislative arm. Assuming that this was a decision that the people of this country wanted, the decision that, let's say, let's approve all this. And then the NDC went in there, and the NDC as a party said, we don't want them to approve. Then the NDC members went there and approved them. I believe Dr. Nko would have been praising the NDC corpus for doing what is right. Just recently, when over 18 members or 19 members of the NDC came out and said that they wanted the Minister for Finance to go and then held a press conference, it was being praised. But the impression is also created at this. The responsibility to ensure that these ministers were not approved just lie only on the NDC. Yes, people would expect that because the NDC is the opposition. How about the NDC members? Some of whom all agree that the, our, our expenditure is ballooning, and therefore there was a need for us not to approve this ministry. So I think that that is the angle I want to look at the, the issue. And if you want to have an intellectual discourse, I think that we need to be looking at it on both sides. It is embarrassing, it is shameful that NDC, some NDC members did that. Unfortunately, you don't even know those who voted to approve them and those who voted not to approve them, because everybody is claiming that I did ABC. But the bottom line is... Okay, uh, Mutala, we would, have to, we would have to hold you here and bring in uh, the other guests as well. Thank you. Uh, just hold for me. Let me also bring in Dr. Rashid Draman, uh, who is with the African Center for uh, Parliamentary Affairs. Doc, a very good morning to you. Hello, Dr. Draman. 
Yes. Good morning, Benjamin. Great. I, I, I'd just like to find out from you, uh, we've already delved into the conversation, so quick preliminary thoughts on what transpired in Parliament uh, over the weekend, Thursday, Friday, especially on Friday. And with everything that has happened, the likes of Dr. Asasanti say the NBC was not interested in the national interest but parochial interest. We've seen uh, Franklin Kujo uh, say that, look, uh, 2024 is slipping away and that the NDC is not doing the people's bidding, so to speak, in Parliament. It also appears that the whipping system in Parliament is failing as far as the minority is concerned. Some have even gone as far as suggesting that this is a failure on the part of the new leadership of the NDC in Parliament by letting this vote go this way. Are you in agreement with, with these? And if you feel differently, why? Well, uh, Benjamin, let me say, first of all, that, uh, uh, I mean, right now, I think there's a lot of speculation uh, about the position of the NDC and in terms of the, the numbers that voted uh, uh, um, in favor of the ministerial nominee. Look, what we don't know uh, at this moment is uh, whether the rebels in the MPP, some of them also voted against the minister because the ballots were mixed. So in trying to I mean, put any blame on the NDC, I think we have to keep this, this in mind. I mean, having said that, you know, they were in a position. But, 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 but Dr. Draman, let's, let's, yes. let's do just a bit of basic mathematics. Even if we assume that, let's say, of the 127 members of parliament that the MPP wields in that house. Let's say 27 uh, voted against the, 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 the nominees. It would obviously mean that many more from the other side would have had to vote. And if they maintained their numbers, it would still mean that a sizable number of those from the other end would have had to vote. Either way, it is clear when you look at the numbers, the 150 something, 160 something, 140 something, that some numbers from the other end moved towards their end to see the approval through. Yes, yeah, that's true. I mean, that's true. The point I'm making is that I think we 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 want to get uh, do a very proper analysis of whether I mean the blame squarely lies on the NDC or there are also members of the MPP caucus who were not happy and who also joined uh, the, the, the 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 majority of the NPP NDC members to vote. That's the point I'm just making because right now people are bandying figures like 31 uh, NDC MPs joined um, the, the MPP book to vote for Honorable Brian and Campo, for instance. I mean, that we don't know. That we don't know. But having said all that, it's certainly the case that a lot of Ghanaians expected the, the NDC, especially given the I mean, pre-vote press conference that we, we had from uh, the, the leadership of the COCO, that we are ready, we are going to uh, vote against this minister, and so on and so forth. So the question is, when the leader said we are ready and we have the numbers, I mean, on what basis was he saying that? He simply meant the outcome showed that uh, there are still issues of unity within the COCO, uh, Benjamin. And for me, from where I sit, you know, I was saying this yesterday on your network that, and many people don't, don't agree with that, but the fact is when a party is in opposition, one of the key measures of its performance is the performance of the members of the caucus of that party in parliament. And if the party has to project an image of a credible alternative, of a government in which and that's a better alternative, then I think the caucus in parliament, you know, must be seen to be working very much in sync with the party leadership to the extent that we don't see any disagreement. Because yesterday we heard that, you know, all the members of the caucus were consulted, they were called into a meeting and it was agreed that this was how they were going to vote. 
So if we go into the vote and we see these differences as cracks, I think the NDC has a lot of work to do. Did the NDC, did the NDC fail? ordinary Ghanaians who felt that this was not the way to go, as Franklin Kujo su suggests on Twitter. Was it a failure on that part? Yes, yes, yes. I think that one I agree. Because, I mean, all of us, uh, Benjamin, you and I, every Ghanaian has suffered from the current crisis that, that we are going through. And, I mean, the least symbolic kind of uh, measure that a government at this time can take is try to show to Ghanaians that at least uh, we feel your pain and we, we, we are doing that through some of the little things that we can do, i.e. maybe reducing the size of government, as I mean, most Ghanaians have said. So on that score, certainly, I think uh, um, the, the, those who voted in favor of the ministers, I think we're not I mean, voting uh, according to the wishes of, of, uh, of many Ghanaians. But, but you know, at the, at the root of it, at the root of it is that, you know, there are very serious issues and very serious cracks within the NDC. And I think it's not too late, I believe, that perhaps the leadership and the caucus need to sit down and, and carefully iron out this difference. Because, Benjamin, you know, as you know, in this day parliament, what we have come to realize is that even one seat difference a one member difference can make can make a, 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 can decide whether a party is in majority or is in minority. Right. And so it is in their interest and in the interest of Ghanaians that they close their ranks very, very quickly. Right. Because if you have uh, maybe this might be a backbench revolt, just like what we saw in the MPP when they were calling for the head of the, the minister. And this can translate, this can go down to the consequences, and this can go down to how people are going to vote. We have seen in this country instances where people voted blouse, I mean, skirt and blouse. They will vote for an MP and vote against the party's presidential nominee, or vice versa. I think their strategies, the strategies in the NDC, I think should consider all these factors. Right. And quickly make sure that they get their acts together. All right. Uh, uh, Doc, uh, very insightful. Let me bring in uh, Professor Safu Kantanka, a lecturer at the University of Cape Coast, also a parliamentary affairs analyst. Prof, good morning. Good morning, Benjamin. Last week, we were talking about the self same subject, and you had a bit of a disagreement with Mutala Mohammed, who's on the line, together with, uh, you know, the other representative as well. Today, after what has happened in Parliament, one, what would be your assessment of what transpired? Were you surprised in any way? And two, some have said this plays out badly for the new leadership of the minority in Parliament, led by Dr. Kassel Atoforsen, that the whipping system didn't work, that they thought they had numbers on their side, but apparently, uh, as we say in Chi, no mada, and so they were asleep, but their legs were out, outside of the cloth or outside of the tent. How do you respond to these? Thank you very much, uh, uh, Benjamin. Uh, I would say that I, I'm not surprised at all. I wasn't surprised. And I'll come to the reason why. And also why I think uh, the minority failed. I'll come to that. But before then, let, let me chip in that. You know, last uh, uh, that was Friday program. After I spoke in, um, Motala Mohammed, the MP for Tamale Central, um, responded in a I had listened to Joy News in the morning, and that according to the reporter, the minority had attempted to negotiate or trade off uh, certain things, especially in relation to The opposite, that, that actually was brought in by the majority. I was a bit confused. And so when I went back, I gave him the benefit of the doubt. I went for the audio, that is the Friday morning, Joe FM News. And it was exactly what I said. OK, 
Okay. So, and I, I, as I said, had the words used by uh, Motala, and he said I did that to apologize. I mean, now who should apologize to who? Because actually I was right. I was absolutely right. But, but, but technically, technically, I think, I think the dispute was the fact that there had been some agreement from the minority end, okay, yes. with, with the majority on the CI. He came out and categorically said that, no, there had not been any such engagement. Benjamin. But Benjamin, on, on whether, I mean, no one could tell why anybody voted. That, that, that wouldn't be the caucus deciding to vote that way. Let's clarify that. Hello, Prof. The connection to Professor, Professor Safu Kantanka uh, keeps getting interrupted. But Prof, if you can hear me, go ahead. Here's what we're going to try to do. We'll try to reach Professor Safu Kantanka via the phone lines, if possible, and uh, get his thoughts because it's, it's crucial, uh, some of the points he's making. And he's responding to some of what Mutala uh, Mohammed uh, said the last time we had an interaction and some of what he's been saying uh, today. But while we try to get Prof back on the line, let me uh, go back to Dr. Asa Asante. Uh, on, on that same point, this plays badly, as some have said, for the NDC's new leadership. They've obviously, by this, per what some people have said, not been able to whip their party members in line, not been able to hold the front and hold government accountable. The six nominees were passed. There's also that rhetoric that this has exposed the NDC, and with those cracks they are showing in Parliament, it would lead to 2024, that election, on the presidential level, slipping away from the minority. Do you buy into this? No, 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 no. Um, let me begin, but let me, uh, Mutala said something, and let me respond quickly, all right? He said that, um, why are we blaming uh, only the NDC for uh, voting the way they did? Right. But the blame also falls squarely on the majority as well. Uh, that question is mute in the sense that we have seen that the MPP has failed to check their own government in terms of what the size of government. All right. So the only savior for us as the people of this country is a minority caucus. So if they go there and then fail us, can't we say that? It is incumbent upon them to do the needful by voting massively in their numbers, 136, that even if they, they, the people will beat them to it, we would have seen that a 136 played out and that they would have carried the day. So uh, Mutala, my good friend, should admit that they owe us a duty. And what duty are we talking about? A duty of responsibility that they can't check it out. Yes, it is true that there are some of the issues that uh, they stood firmly, they did all that. But we are talking about this current situation, which they, our problem is that they made a lot of noise about the size of government and all that, and they make sure that uh, they, they vote according to a certain line and all that. They call their people from all over the, the world that they should come home and come and vote. So what we are experiencing, don't we need to talk about it? I'm sure Honorable knows that we need to talk and talk about that. It will save them. Because, you see, these things have effects on voting in constituencies. And I want to believe that they have taken political notice of this and that they will patch up. Otherwise, uh, the story could be different when it comes to primaries and all that. That is a fact, and my friend knows that. Now I move on to the issue that people think that uh, with this uh, poor performance of, on the part of the NDC, the NDC is going to fizzle out in terms of the presidential election. That is uh, something that nobody can say, all right? If you put this one aside, NDC... But, 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 if, but if, if, if this disunity on the floor of parliament against the party's wishes, so to speak, we heard the rhetoric from the administrative end of the party to the legislative end of the party. If those cracks prevail... Can it not only lead to one result in election 2024? Oh, no. The, what will happen is the worst case scenario is that and those who are there that they are saying they are going to fill them out, uh, they can lose their primaries and the rest of them. All right? But the party itself has not done badly at all. They have stood firmly on the ground. 
making sure that they are holding government to account, all right? And sometimes we have heard what they, in terms of policies they've thrown out instead of statement and the rest of them. The party has been solidly on the ground working for power. And so for somebody to say that, look, with this, uh, you know, problems, uh, the party will not be able to compete effectively, so to speak. And then for the presidential, they are going to lose out. That, for me, uh, is, is, is not, not, not supported by evidence on the ground. No. We have to wait and see how the campaign will go and the rest of them. But to, you know, um, tell it uh, straight away that they are going to lose, I'm afraid I want to disassociate, disassociate myself from that position. All right. uh, we don't know yet. We need to go to the ground and pick data and then see what will happen. But come to it. You also mentioned about the fact that is it a failure on the part of the new leadership? All right. I will not say it's a failure. It's not. Because I know the system of government we are practicing. That, yes, they were allowed in town that they will make sure that people will vote in a certain direction. And that's why I've said that when you have a hybrid system where uh, what is playing out now tells me that there is a weak party discipline. You don't make too much uh, noise and too much what uh, statement to the fact that you, you are whipping people to lie. They will vote differently. And that has been a feature of the presidential system in America where the presidential system exists purely, you will see that people get to parliament and then they vote against even their own parties in there. But when you have a parliamentary system, there is always what they fear of you losing power because of what? A vote of no confidence. And that right. one, that's where right. they are able to whip them to lie. So that one, I don't think the leadership has failed. Okay. Uh, if there is any failure, it is that they said too much and that they were not measured to know that, uh, you know, uh, these things will happen. Especially, right. they do not take into consideration the system of government that we have, that there's a weak party discipline, that they cannot whip anybody to lie. So going forward, I think that uh, people, uh, they will be measured in terms of the things that they tell us. And then we also, as a society, have to also uh, manage our expectations. When okay. we are able to do this, we will not be surprised. In other words, talk less, do more. That's your advice to the NDC. And just hold for me, Doc. Let me try one more time to see whether we can get uh, Professor Safo Kantanka back. Prof, can you hear me? Okay, so we do not have Prof. I would have wanted him to conclude on some of what... Hello, Prof. Professor Safo Kantanka, if you can hear me, uh, just give me some sort of response. Hello, Prof. Can you hear me? Yeah, hello, Benjamin. Right, good, good. Good to have you now. You were making a point. Please conclude on that uh, as briefly as you can. Yeah, so I, I, I was saying that I was absolutely right. But it was unfortunate the way that or Tamil Central spoke about me to the extent of him trying to question my, the integrity of my, my title as a professor. That was very unfortunate. Even if I, was, I made a mistake, even if I was wrong, the way he spoke to me wasn't the best. And so... This connection is not allowing us to have a, a fluid uh, conversation. But, but let me uh, segue then and bring in uh, someone who has been under fire for a while now, the Member of Parliament for Tamale Central. And uh, under fire is just uh, a jovial uh, bit. Don't take it too personally, Mutala. Uh, so, Prof for example, feels aggrieved about how you referred to him the last time. Do you feel any apologies are due? And uh, then we can get into other, other topical uh, matters. Uh, Butala, what's your take on that? Well, first and foremost, I, I never use any word against the person of Prof. We were having an intellectual discourse. And to be very honest, my demand for him to apologize still stands. Because it doesn't matter what Joy FM reported or any media house reported. If you see that the NDC as a caucus negotiated. And I say that's not true. And Benjamin, Benjamin, prove me wrong. Did the NDC as a caucus negotiate with the NDC? The answer is big no. So if you come on a program and you say that the NDC negotiated because you had it on joy, and my point was that as an academic, if you want to make such conclusion, you don't make the conclusion based on what a radio station said. Assuming that that was the information you had, and someone who is a member of the caucus says that we never negotiated. So when he says that we should apologize to who? And to be very honest, if he felt grief about the way I presented it, I sincerely apologize. But I still maintain that 
he, he, the apology to the NDC still stands. Because mind you, when we said that the NDC negotiated, he went ahead to say that by their food we shall know them. In the class one chap knows, when someone says by their food we shall know them. So it hasn't changed anything. It doesn't matter. He said he's, he's right because he went and, and listened to the audio and he was right. Uh, why was he right? He could only be right if the NDC actually negotiated with the NPP. So right. it doesn't matter whether... I, 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 think, I think I brought up that point. Let, let, let me, to let, to let be me, fair, I brought up that point. Let me complete. It doesn't matter whether BBC or CNN or Al Jazeera or Joy FM announced that there was some negotiation. What matters is, was there a negotiation? The point is that there was no negotiation. So it means that if any media house reported that, that media house was wrong. So okay. you, don't conclude, you, you don't conclude based on a wrong information. And the apology to them is still stands. But if he, if he felt, as we I sincerely apologize. And remember, I said, I have so much respect for him. I have so much respect for academics. My only problem is when he said, and said, by their proof, we shall know them. What does it connote? Right. And again, doc, Dr. Ansar Santi, I have never said that the NDC should not take responsibility. And I made that statement because you are my lecturer and you are also academic. What mm -hmm. I said was that, yes, our conduct or the conduct of some of us was very shameful. However, okay. the responsibility to hold the executive accountable is not done by only one side of the house. It is done by both sides. Right. If Doc I, th I think that, that point... <coughs> if Doc had said that there is a reason why they have a problem with the NDC because the NPC had failed. I wouldn't have made that comment. That, that, point, that point has been very clearly made. I want to go into how the voting went and ask you some topical questions. But uh, I would like to start from here. Some of your colleagues have already put out, uh, at least we've seen one, who put out how he or she voted against these nominees. Uh, your constituents are watching. I'm sure they'd be interested in uh, as well. How did you vote, especially as, like I said, some of your colleagues have already put theirs out there, and as your party leadership on social media has acknowledged that SMSC did well, this person did well, that person did well. How did you vote? I'm surprised you don't know how I voted. The I have to ask person, you, I don't know what you did in the booth. I'm saying that the first person who was voting came out, unfortunately, and I say unfortunately, even captured on video was me. I haven't seen anybody's video that is captured anybody's voting that is captured on video. Okay. And when I took that video, I never took the video for the public consumption. I took the video just as a person, so it doesn't defeat or defeat... Why, 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 why did you say you took the video as a person? If not to, to give any proof, why did you have to take that video? No, in fact, Adam, if you ask Honorable Agboja, I told Honorable Agboja that because of the past experience and the matter of the approval of how Kumsin and Kudopo and Kumen go, I would insist as a corporate that everybody should take evidence of how he or she voted. In fact, as Honorable Agoja. Right. If I was the one who was proposing that the, the minority chief whip should demand that everybody does that. So when I took the video, I was talking to one person, someone from the National Executive Office. When the person called and said what they heard about what a colleague of ours did, and I said, look, I don't have any evidence as to whether that person did that. I am in the month of Ramadan and fasting. I cannot give account or testimony to something I don't have any evidence, even if I'm not in the month of Ramadan, I can't do that. However, I took a video when I was voting, and then the person said, oh, you could you send it to me? I sent it to the person, and I trusted that the person would keep it. So, so this person betrayed you? Well, I, I, I don't feel betrayed, specifically, maybe perhaps... It was okay, so this person to... shared, this person shared the video, because and you didn't share it yourself. Said, even when someone called me and said, oh, they saw a video with my voice, and how I voted, no, no, throughout. And I called the person, I said, oh, but how can you do this? If I never trusted, I wouldn't. In any case, I wasn't prepared to, to share this video with anybody. I just wanted to keep it because I was a proponent to the chief, minority chief, that everybody should take evidence. And the person shared it. So I'm surprised that you didn't. And you, I believe Mutala, you but if you, if you just wanted this as some sort of evidence to show your party's leadership, you didn't have to share it with this person. By no, sharing that, it, by sharing that, it, do you admit to yourself you, maybe you were careless in a way, reckless? No, that person I told you is a national executive officer of the party, and I didn't call the person to share. When the person called to find out how the voting went, and told me about a rumor they had about one of our colleagues, as whether and I said no, I don't have any evidence to that allegation, you know. And we had plenty discussion. I said as far as I'm concerned, I took a video. 
And the person said, oh, could you share it with me? I sent it to the person. Only for the person we share it. So it is not about being careless. Who is this person? I won't mention that person. It, so this person is in the, the, the executive leadership of your party? Yes, that person is. Mm. Yeah. But you still don't want to mention who this person is? No, no, no. I, I don't think I would. I called the person and I expressed my mis misgiving and how unhappy I was. That day. Which position does this person occupy? I won't tell you. Right before I bring in Dr. Draman, and uh, j just quickly on this point, so how do you feel about your colleague MPs who likely voted? Definitely some of them had to have voted uh, for the nominees. How do you feel about them, especially as your party's secretary, Fifi Kweti, uh, labels these minority MPs as traitors? That is a hard word to use. How do you feel about them? Well, first and foremost, I, I don't think that Honorable Fifi, with all due respect, needed to have done that. I had a conversation with him yesterday. He called me last night. We had a conversation. And frankly speaking, I said that he ought to have avoided that because in as much as he's angry, just like any of us, because some of our colleagues, unfortunately, betrayed the cause. There can't be any description about what they did except to say that it was a betrayal. But I think that, and I indicated, that when you have challenges such as you need sober head. And his view was that, yes, we need sober head, but he thinks that certain people ought to be called out. And I said, once it is a secret ballot, how do you call out those people? For all you know, the people who may speak the loudest may be those who betrayed even the, the, the party. That I made that. In fact, I was talking to, to as he just called me this morning, the minority leader. We're having a conversation. When your call came, I had to, I had to tell him that I had an interview. But all of us, and the way he spoke, I think that for me, it demonstrates maturity. At this material moment, we need to be head as a party. Everybody you, wait, wait, wait. Just, just hold it there. You say the way your party secretary spoke uh, I, evinces I said, immaturity. Said, Is that what he said? No. I said, I did. No, no. I said, when things like this happen, we need to be head. And okay. I said that I disagree with the, the, the serializing of, of those who my party general secretary thinks that, you know, they did not betray the cause. And I made it very clear to him. I said that when things like this happen, we need sober head. We need to be very clear. And he said, look, it is important. He agreed that we need sober head. However, he thinks that we should call out those who betray the party. And my point to him was, how do you identify those who betray the party? Now, remember, he said, oh, Mutala, you, your video is out. You haven't betrayed the party. You can vouch for somebody. But I'm saying that there are certain people who will be speaking, just like I'm speaking, who necessarily didn't vote against, who vote for the position of the party. You cannot tell, because it's a secret ballot. So that is just the point I'm making. So All I right. didn't say that, that my party general secretary didn't show my truth. I never right. said that. No, 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 no. I, I, listen, so as you speak, sometimes the connection is not so clear. I only asked you whether that was what you had said, Mutala. Anyway, thank you uh, for that clarification. Let me bring in uh, Dr. Rashid Draman. Uh, so, Doc, uh, we've heard Mutala say that, contrary to what you suggested, it wasn't a failure on the part of uh, the minority in Parliament. We know you have to take leave of us. What exactly is, is, um, is your appreciation of what happened on the day in terms of these dynamics? It is clear that the whipping system didn't work. It is clear that the new leadership of the NDC and Parliament has a lot of work to do. But what would be your parting words, especially listening to Mutala insist that the party did not fail, the, the people of Ghana? Well, I mean, the, I, I mean, the party definitely failed because if they had, as yesterday, uh, their communications officer was on a program with him, and he said all the members of the caucus were consulted. They had a meeting, and then they had uh, an agreement to vote in a certain way. They went in there, and then a number of them broke ranks with the party. So how do we interpret, what, what kind of words and adjectives can we use to describe this? And Benjamin, my, my parting words are that, look, I think, I mean, after all is said and done, uh, we have to manage expectations right. uh, in a hung parliament. There's no one party that is strong enough, and there's no one party that is weak enough. So members... I mean, the leadership of both caucuses, I think, have to be very, very strategic. 
they have to choose strategically the kind of battles that they can win and those that they cannot win and you know decide accordingly because if you are not sure that you have your entire focus behind you particularly when you know you were coming out of a situation where there was some rebellion a couple of weeks ago uh, i mean a rebellion that saw a number of the caucus members say they disagreed with uh, with with the new i mean the appointment of the new leadership or the way it was done and i mean during that discussion one of the things that some of us said was that look you know people will be whipped if they want to be whipped you know if somebody doesn't want to be whipped or he doesn't agree with the leader or the whip then it becomes very very problematic and particularly when you add the dimension of the secret ballot but for me uh, benjamin you know it's very exciting times for me i mean looking at our democracy and looking at what is happening i think we are growing because i want to see more and more situations where i mean maybe yes we are in a very bad economic uh, uh, era right now and perhaps maybe this is one time that Ghanaians wanted uh, maybe the, the parliamentarians to behave in a certain way but i want to see more and more instances where members of parliament are showing that yes we are trustees with independence and we can vote our mind uh, irrespective of what what party we don't want situations where you know some powerful president or some powerful party dictates to our mp how about we the citizens i mean i know in this instance somebody would question that the citizens wanted the mp to behave in a certain way so yes i think that this is uh, an exceptional situation but for me if i put it all in context i think our democracy is growing uh, we saw on january 6 uh, to january 7 what happened we saw on the on this last friday what happened when I mean, you put it all together uh, i think we are beginning to see more and more uh, independent minded mps right um, and, and in our in our in our legislature and and on balance on balance let me say because there are some who say the hung parliament i think is a case um, i totally disagree with that i think uh, as honorable muntala has outlined earlier some of the achievements in this hung parliament i mean i've been following our parliament for more than 20 years now it's only in this eighth parliament that i've seen some of what i have seen in terms of parliament really showing that you know it, it has teeth to bite uh, particularly when it comes to financial and budgetary oversight and so on and so forth right this is this is a low point but uh, i think it's a low point in a, in a in a race that we still have about two years or so to go so hopefully the ndc will learn the lessons and get this act together and make sure that this front and the caucus is very tightly knit and then they can go into battle in 2024 and uh, hopefully maybe um, if, if Ghanaians so wish, they will give them the mandate. Do Dr. Draman, uh, right, right before you take leave of us, just a little bit to add. Do you feel then, uh, looking at the other side, can the MPP beat its chest and say all our members voted for the cause? Because what we do not know is whether that happened. They won which obviously shows that some members from the other side crossed carpet, so to speak, yes. in the voting. But can the MPP itself also state categorically that none of their members voted no. the other way? Indeed, no, uh, Benjamin. And that was why I was telling you that I would have wished that the right honorable speaker didn't say the ballots should, should be mixed. Let, I mean, if the ballots were counted separately, let's see how the MPP MPs voted and let's see how the NDC MPs voted. Because... Even in the ranks of the MPP, we know, I mean, you and I are in this country, we know the rebellion, I mean, they still haven't given up. They want the finance minister out, and they are unhappy about that. They are unhappy about so many other things. So it would have been very, very interesting to see how each caucus voted. Then we can put the discussion in a much, much better perspective. You know, right now, I think it's just uh, we are still in the realm of speculation. And, I mean, I don't know whether... For instance, uh, those that crossed carpet and voted for the right honorable speaker on the night of January 6th, whether the NDC, MPP has been able to find these, uh, these MPs. In the same way, it's going to be very difficult to find uh, who voted how. 
except, of course, I mean, those who have put out their votes in public, which is also against the principles right. of secret balloting. Because you remember, on the day of the election of the Speaker, Honorable Muntaka as whip and the NDC caucus disagreed vehemently and said they would not agree to an instance where members of the MPP would vote and show their vote to somebody else. Uh, but some members of the NDC have done that uh, this time around, including, you know, uh, we are seeing people being congratulated for the way they voted. How did, how did anybody know how somebody voted? Mm -hmm. How did anybody know how somebody voted? Right. So I think we have to maintain that principle. Otherwise, tomorrow, if there's going to be a secret ballot, that is likely to go in favor of the MPP and the NDC uh, makes a case that they will not agree to, uh, you know, people showing how they, they, they vote. You know, I mean, people are going to question uh, right. their behavior in this particular instance. Mm -hmm. So, yes, you are right. I think we don't know. It's possible mm -hmm. that some of the rebels from mm -hmm. the MPP voted against the, the nominee. But, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, now we'll never know it. The ballots were mixed. And we'll, we'll never be able to know that. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rashid uh, Draman, for joining the conversation. He is uh, with the African Center for Parliamentary Affairs. We'll try to get Professor Safu Kantanka back uh, on uh, the line. I'll come to you, uh, Dr. Asasanti, before I go back to uh, Mutala. Now, looking at all of what we've discussed uh, thus far, as we get ready to wind down on the conversation, the whip system, the whip system in Parliament, should it be less restrictive so that people can vote the way their conscience directs, propels them to vote, like we saw when the new Speaker of Congress had to be elected, and many Republicans on, on, on a certain uh, or of a certain notion decided not to vote for him. You saw the number of times they had to vote, over 15 times before uh, he got the nod. Should our whip system in Parliament be less restrictive? How do we go about it? And... Um, <clears throat> Looking at the fact that you could say the generality of people on social media expressed that they wanted the minority to go against these nominees, at least from a lot of what we saw. The majority of people said they did not want these nominees adding to the numbers of ministers. That has not happened. When these things continue, what could be the impact on our democracy and even voting patterns? Two questions. Yeah. Uh, look at the whip system. I have said, and I'll repeat, that uh, what we're experiencing is born out of the system of government that we have in place. If you have a hybrid, it has both features of presidential and parliamentary. And if you are looking at what is happening now, it tells me that, strictly speaking, we are in the realm of uh, this aspect. What is more dominant is the presidential for this case in particular, because the whip system didn't work. It is when you what you go on the other side to have what uh, you know a strict party discipline, then you are talking about the fact that if you don't vote on a major policy that is before parliament for consideration and you lose vote, you are likely to suffer a vote of no confidence. That one you see the web system works very well. So in our system, it is clear to me that yes, it's a hybrid, but we are seeing in some instances. For in, what we are talking about is what the issue of the 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 the, the weak party discipline manifesting itself strongly against a, uh, you know a strong party discipline. So here, yes, MPs as soon as they get to parliament, uh, they they are not obliged to do the bidding of the party. The the this one it's telling you that MPs are voting based on their conscience, but not uh, along the lines of what the parties because if that were to be the case they would have what voted along the lines of the party and that becomes what a strict party discipline so this one our parliament it tells you that they are free to vote but what we are saying that out of that freedom we are saying that the people's interest must be paramount which well, what, you know what, what if before so, you proceed what if we knew for a fact that uh, these votes were not purely on the back of you know, aiding government's business or the national interest, but there were other parochial interests. How, how then would you feel? Yeah, your parochial interests uh, do not, you don't put that one ahead of the national interest. Then it defeats the purpose for which we are put you there. Remember that the MPs, uh, they, they are representatives of the people. 
We are dealing with a representative democracy. We are saying that out of 32 million Ghanaians or so, uh, all of us cannot be in parliament as it happens in our tents, all right, where almost every adult male gets there. But we are taking a sample of the people to represent us. And you represent our interests, our opinions, and our aspirations. So if you go there and you don't represent our interests and you do that of your own, I'm sorry, then you are in a wrong you know, forum. You are not there for us. And that is why we put you there. So at a point in that, even though we know that you have to be independent, and then uh, decide on certain things but then where there is a national interest a national call and you yourself have also come out to say that yes we need to what cut down the size we need to what reduce expenditure and all that so why do you chicken out at the 11th hour that is where the problem is mm. uh, the other aspect of your question is that uh, what is the implication for uh, voting an election um in ghana here yes uh uh, people look at their leaders in parliament and the things that they do uh, sometimes influence the choices of voters, all right? Uh, uh, it's one thing that if you look at the literature, it's not that strong so much. The prominent factors are the economy, um, the, the rule of law, infrastructure development, um, you know, corruption, the rest of them. So I am afraid that this one is a big issue, but that when it comes to voting, right, some people can look at that and then decide to vote for the other reps in parliament and the rest of them. But if you look at it in a general sense, the factors that influence voter choice is the economy, number one, first and foremost. That if you have a party that will be able to articulate clearly what its economic policies are, that will bring a sigh of relief for people. People are ready to gravitate towards that party and give them their, their votes. Uh, they look at what the second issue, what issue of infrastructure development. They want the constitution from the, the directive pr uh, principle of state policy states that uh, every aspect of this country must at least have some development. So people expect this, and that translates into voting. Corruption is another important variable that the Ghanaians think that it has affected governance and way of life, for which reason they want a party to have the muscle to deal with it and uh, the rest of their whole lot. Uh, other issues coming and issues like this, that the way my MPs represent me in parliament, I'm not happy. That right. one is left at the individual level. Most people uh, don't necessarily look at that. But uh, let us remember that because of the system of uh, electoral system that we operate, that is the first pass the first uh, post system, right. every single vote counts. So one vote can take you from an MP, sorry, from a candidate to become an, an MP. And the same way, that one vote can remove you as an MP to what? Okay. Uh, you know, a non MP. Okay. So every single vote counts. You don't want to take chances. We are saying that uh, if we are seeing this going on, on things that Ghanaians uh, uh, is of interest to them. Uh, it can form a certain decision, uh, opinion on their minds. Right. And let us remember that every single vote counts. So even if one person is going to what, gauge you by that and vote against you, it can throw you out right. for what, your dream to become an MP or even the president. So it's something that they cannot take it what, for granted. I'll be coming back to all of you gentlemen, and I'll give a little extra time. If we have Prof on the line, I'll give him a little extra time. But Mutala, so, 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 uh, Mutala, uh, I'll, I'll let you come in and then uh, I'll take Prof and then I'll take your final uh, comments very briefly on, on all of this. It is said that any entity or person or group is only as strong as its weakest link. It is obvious from the last vote that there are a lot of weak links, uh, which the, maybe your side of parliament would not have wanted. Is the NDC still as strong as the party purports? And how will the NDC heal after all of this? You did not like the wording of Fifi Kwete when he said uh, some MPs were traitors, but he said that. So there's healing to be done. How will it be done? Well, first of all, you seem to be misrepresenting me today. Initially, you said whether you asked me whether I said Immaturity. I never said that. Again, you said 
I said that the NDC didn't fail Ghanaians. I never said that. What I said was that... Uh, co correct me, Murtala. I, it was a question I posed. I no, said that what, I had asked you whether you had said no, that. I never no, suggested you did say that. No, but you, you, when you were asking, Doc, you said that Honorable Murtala thinks that NDC didn't fail Ghanaians. That is not a true representation of what I said. You asked me and I said the NDC did not only fail Ghanaians, but fail the human masses of our people. Oh, okay. Then, I then, then no, like I said, sometimes some of what you say gets lost in transition. So, part my apologies then, because uh, what I heard was what I said. So, I apologize. I get lost in transition on this interaction. Mutala, please go ahead. <laughs> please so, go ahead. So, so what, what I'm saying is that, look, the, 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 we need to go ahead. The NDC is still strong. This is just a blip as far as I'm concerned. I mean, disappointed and frustrated as we are, and the fact that some of our colleagues did not only betray the NDC as a party, betrayed majority of the people of this country. And I think that it ought to be said. But if you want to be crying over this, then that would even affect us the more. I am very convinced that the NDC will rise again. I am very convinced with the kind of leadership we have. You have a national chairman and secretaries who are profoundly experienced. And I believe that the, the caucus, we will re, you know, reunite. And, and for me, the backlash that comes with what we did in Parliament, unfortunately, those who betrayed the party and betrayed the people of this country, I believe that they will be embarrassed, they will be very shameful now, and they would have realized that the people of this country have so much hope in the NDC as a, 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 a caucus in Parliament. I am very convinced that going forward, we shall learn our, you know, from these experiences, and I'm very convinced that the NDC will do things you know, differently. I have no doubt. In fact, the interactions I've had with the national secretary and also the minority leader, it gives me hope right. that, look, this is just, just a misstep. I mean, regardless how frustrated and angry everybody is, mm -hmm. I'm very convinced that the NDC will unite again moving forward. All right. <laughs> uh, 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 this may not be the House of Parliament where the hands that captures everything legitimate, but I just want you to go back and clarify. So you said... Not only did the NDC fail Ghanaians, but also, I just want the quote. The second part was what? Not only, not only did the NDC fail Ghanaians, we failed the human masses of our people because a lot of people are off in the NDC. Right. You know, people who neither belong to any political party. I believe that Prof, you know, and Dr. and the two doctors, Dr. Santi and Dr. Bremer, I don't think they belong to any of the political parties. Their concern is that they have too much hope in the NDC as an opposition party in, in Parliament, and they were expecting that we would have done, done things differently. In fact, then, the concern of the NDC was that, look, if we went in and we had all our 136 voting and rejection of this minister, and MPP brings their numbers to win, that would have been a problem. The people of this country would have known that we did what we are expected to do right. as an opposition party. Unfortunately, right. we didn't do And mind you, the IMF, the World Bank, even the Chinese, the people we are going begging for money, all have concerns about government expenditure, and the only way we could reduce the expenditure of government was to have demonstrated our willingness and preparedness to support the position of the people of this country, including civil society organizations and media outlets such as yours. You all expressed concerns about the size of government. So we had an opportunity, unfortunately, we failed them, we can fail the people of this country. Right. Uh, j just hold for me, gentlemen. After I take Prof, because he's been off for a while, after I take him some 30 seconds each and we can wrap the conversation. Professor Safu Kantanka, there, there are a number of points you've wanted to make that you've not been able to make and you've been following the conversation. I'll just throw it to you. What are your parting comments for us? Well, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> yes, when you, uh, when you put the question as to whether I was surprised at the outcome of the voting, I said I wasn't. I was not. The only thing I was surprised at um, was the numbers, because I foresaw that the NDC as a party was going to have a challenge in terms of getting the MP to vote the way they wanted. You see, there was there's this clash between two forms of representation that in the literature is called um, delegate representation and trustee representation. Now. Sometimes you vote people to parliament, and what you ask them to do is that they should always contact you, consult you, to share views, and then represent your views in parliament. The other side of it, trustee, means I have voted for you, you have my word, 
that you can do anything on my behalf without even necessarily contacting me or consulting me. Now, this is where the clash is. You see, and the approach taken by the leadership of the NBC, led by um, Asidun Ketia, is, is a little bit problematic. You see, when you issue a statement to your MP, and all Ghanaians are aware that you've issued this kind of statement, if you're not careful, you are likely to uh, um, face resistance from some members of your party, some members of parliament, because they will think that you are trying to push them and telling Ghanaians that if they don't even have their own conscience on which they can, they can vote. So I would rather advise that if you're issuing a statement, that kind of consultation should be done behind the scenes. This, what the leadership of the party should be doing is that they should always contact their MPs, make, deal with them behind the scenes so that Ghanaians don't know that they are pushing them towards a certain angle. And so I was, I, I actually, when I saw the statement, I felt that it was going to push some members of parliament away from voting uh, for the, uh, uh, the, what the NDC stood for in terms of the approval of the nominees. So, but one of my problem was that I didn't think that the numbers, the difference would be that huge. To the extent of, in some cases, getting about 30 MPs uh, from the minority side voting for the, the, the nominees. The other side of it is this. You see, these, these MPs are friends. Across or between the two sides, there are friends. Let me, let me ask you this question, for example. You've been working with somebody like Kojo Yangtzeng over the years. Assuming one day the two of you find yourselves in parliament, you are on the one side, Kojo is on the other side. And Kojo is appointed as a minister. And he comes to you, Benjamin, I need your vote. And Kojo knows that the numbers are close, the numbers are the same. So if you don't vote for him, he will know that you didn't vote for him. What are you going to do? It will be very difficult on your part not to vote for Kojo. That kind of thing is likely to happen. So I, I foresaw that something like that was going to happen uh, between the two MPs, even though, um, well, somebody could have um, said otherwise. So I saw a big challenge on the part of, of the minority when they were going into that election. But of course, I also wanted to see a principled position about not giving approval to the, um, uh, uh, the nominees. And Benjamin, because of the time, let me chip in this. Going forward, going forward, if we want to talk about the number of ministers, irrespective of which government is in power, we should take that power away from the, the, the individual party and think of maybe a bipartisan approach including civil society organizations, where we can decide based on governance principles and say that if Ghana has, say, 60 uh, ministers, we can still run Ghana the way we want. Right. And so we do that, we are going to find it very difficult. But I'll tell you, when we leave it to the individual parties and in the course of the campaign, they say that if you if you in power, we're going to reduce the number of ministers and all that. It's right. not likely to happen. Because right. they can always have their way by, if, if not um, um, convincing some uh, members of parliament to vote the way uh, others want. We are not going to get there. So for me, we need, to, we need civil society organizations, civil society, both parties to come together for all of us to decide that we need this number of MPs. Because as I said the other time, the number of the 60 ministers' proposals Right. Was well, first put forward by the former mi minority leader, Haruna Idrusu, somewhere during President Kofor's administration. I think between 2004 and 2008, thereabouts. He suggested this and said that Ghana could run with 60 ministers. But over the years, we haven't seen that. So when we leave it in the hands of the individual parties, Benjamin, I'm telling you, it will be a political gimmick. We will get the power and we will still have large numbers of ministers. So that would be my suggestion going forward.
All right. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you so much, um, Prof for uh, joining the conversation this morning. Uh, Professor Safa Kantanka is a lecturer at the University of Cape Coast, also a parliamentary affairs analyst. Uh, for now, I'll just take summary comments from the last two of you. I only gave Prof time because we know how the connection has worked on him today. Uh, Dr. Asa Asante, your concluding comments uh, in, in less than a minute, if you can manage it. Right. What I want to say is that I was not happy when some of the NDC people put out their ballot in terms of photographs to people and the rest of them. Uh, there's a rule, and the rule says that secret ballot. There's a good reason why we keep it secret. So for MPs to go on their own, to show it to the public, to even another person, is wrong. Imagine they experience that on the day of voting from the other side of the political divide at their constituency. How would they feel? So I think that they cannot preach virtues and practice vice here because it's still their interest. It is wrong and it must be condemned in its totality. I don't want to see this and we as Ghanaians don't want to see this because when people also emulate what they have done in terms of voting and exposing uh, the, the, the uh, vote to people on the day of election 2024, how would they feel? I think right. it's wrong. And then going forward also, I think the NDC uh, has learned a lesson. Uh, they know what to do because Every vote, they should remember count, and that they don't want to lose any votes. And so is the situation for all the political parties, that even though, yes, we are talking about majority decision and all that, but we are operating a system called what first past the post system, that whoever crosses the finish line by one vote, you lead as an MP or as a president. So they should not be oblivious of this fact. I think that is the way to go. Thank you, Dr. Kwame Asante, uh, for joining the conversation. Dr. Asante is a political scientist at the University of Ghana, head of the Center for European Studies. Mutala Mohammed is a member of parliament for Tamale Central. You have the final take, sir. Well, I think that I, I, I understand Doc's concern about those of us who voted and took videos and pictures. I think in this country, a general elections in 2008, if I'm not mistaken, one president before voted, I guess he showed. In fact, the recent elections in, in Nigeria, when Buhari voted in Bu, he showed it. We may disagree with it. And the reason why people would do that would be for some specific reason. One thing I would say is that the NDC, we can't have any justification with regards to what we conducted ourselves. And if you observe, then I'm just saying we, even though I voted against the ministers. But I can't place things. It's a collective responsibility. One thing I can just remind everybody is that the NDC promised in several instances and delivered, and I'll reiterate the same point, the elections of the Speaker, the rejection of the budget, the rejection of the e levy and many other things. I don't think that it's, 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 a, it's a failure as a caucus for us to galvanize forces together to do what is expected of us by the people of this country and the team and masses of the NDC. I am very hopeful, and perhaps within the few days coming, there shall be a caucus meeting, which I think, think that when we have the caucus meeting, we shall speak frankly and honestly to each other. And I believe that is the only way we can overcome some of this. There can't be any justification in the conduct. And I just want to conclude by saying that, look, the NDC hasn't failed. And when I say hasn't failed, it hasn't failed as a party, even though this conduct failed, we failed Ghanaians in this particular issue, and we failed the team and masses of our, of our people. You know, there's a saying that a, a man is finished. I think it was Albert Einstein who said that, that a man is finished if he quits, but a man is not finished if he fails. So I think that we fail to deliver. Right. We shall not quit, and therefore, let's see how this... I mean, people are right to, 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 to be angry, but we can't continuously cry over those mouth. We need to pick, pick the bits and pieces and see what we can do to regain the confidence of the people of this country and the confidence right. of the cinema to the language. Thank you. Uh, Tamale Central lawmaker there, Murtala Mohammed, And that's how we cap off this end of the conversation. But stay with us. There's a lot more coming your way. Before we get into that, though, we all know water is life. Where would we be without uh, water? Awake is premium purified water treated through a strict purification process to ensure that every bottle on the market refreshes you uh, better. Now we have the perfect sizes for all purposes, 330 and 500 ml bottles to fit your pockets and bags, 750 milliliters for those who always want more, and there are also uh, our 19 liter jar bottles which are ideal for homes and offices. Let me just add that apart from the 750 milliliter bottles, they also have 1.5 uh, liters. 
Purpose. All you must do now is drink Awake Purified drinking water wherever you go. So choose uh, a bottle of Awake Purified drinking water today and get quality hydration. Awake Purified drinking water, remember, it's always one for life. And for every bottle you purchase, a donation is made to the National Cardiothoracic Center, and that is indeed heartwarming. It's a product of Casa Preco Company Limited. For bulk purchases, just call this number, 0262 351 Two, five, one. This advert is FDA approved. Before we get to our conversation with the Environmental Protection Agency and on climate change, how about we take a swipe at our package? There's a lot that has been happening on the back of the arrival of United States Vice President Kamala Harris. That is up next on the AM Show.